know about it. But how do we make sure that young people are able to connect with access? Um, any person to the bring in new things, uh, bring more voices to that table. I think the, the last thing I'll say is if you're going to hear about all these pieces, how do we also make sure that we expand from the tools that are available to us? How do we make sure um, that together we are keeping our city uh, just vibrant and uh, that story around? So uh, this room, uh, as you look around, you may see people, maybe there's people that know of and maybe people that you don't know at all. Um, our hope is that we know that each of you has a purview of work that you're doing. Some of you are in a specific district commission in a specific neighborhood. And that is really important. And the hope is that we get to a place where people feel part of a larger body of folks who are working across the city collaboratively um, to hold all of these pieces together, not, not just holding our own pieces, but bringing that and connecting with a larger group. So with that, um, I want to take this opportunity. You are in the commemoration commission. Would you mind standing? These are the newest members of the historic preservation community um, within uh, Boston. And so we want to take an opportunity to welcome you and to thank you for um, your service, your commitment, um, and the work that you will do. Thank you. So with no further ado, I'm going to take an opportunity to introduce you to the next speaker. Um, some of you, I think, probably have met him. Some of you have not. Um, we many much of our work has gone online, and that means that it's like actually a little bit harder to like bump into people or have a chat before or after a meeting. Um, it's one of the reasons that we wanted to be in person as much as possible. Uh, but I want to introduce our uh, director of historic preservation, Murray Miller, who came to us uh, started this year in June. Um, but he comes to us um, and at an exciting time where, for those of you, we'll, you'll hear a little bit more about the specifics of the Commemoration Commission, but where we have an opportunity to chart a path of expanding Boston's story as many more people are going to be coming. In 2026, we're going to have people from around the world coming. Um, and uh, in 2030, we will look more strategically at our own activity as a city. Uh, but one, one to invite him to come out and share um, a vision for historic preservation. We still have many conversations with staff and some of you, and uh, it's a lot of folks to really look at what could we do and um, how can we take what is already a solid foundation to be our example in many other parts of the country, but what is the next layer of work for us? How do we expand upon what we have already built so well? Thank you. Um, I'll just say a couple of words about my background. Uh, my background is in architecture and historic preservation. I have worked in four countries over the last 37 years uh, in local government, state, federal, private practice. And I've also taught at the University of Texas at Arnold. So historic preservation is a inextricable passion of mine. The architecture in me, the architect in me, likes to be able to explore the interface between the old and the new. So that raises the issue of context. How do we embrace change? How do we embrace density in places that are very sensitive? That's an area that I've always been interested in. And I continue to design um, for developers, actually, um, new homes in historic districts. So that constant practicing, <coughs> regulating, teaching, learning 
is multidimensional. So I will share some thoughts uh, this evening. And I will try and plant some seeds and ideas. This is a fairly high level uh, vision. So uh, it is not with the detail that uh, we might expect in other types of planets. In a bit, a bit more contrast with the lights. So I want to thank you all for joining us this evening on what is a milestone occasion where every commission under the umbrella of the Office of Historic Preservation might be represented here tonight. It's a special honor to be with you this evening from the reconfigured former Ferdinand's Blue Store one of a chain of department stores that began right here in Roxbury. Roxbury, one of the first towns founded by the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1630, is now the heart of Black culture in Boston and home to Hispanic, Caribbean, and Asian families. It is fitting in a neighborhood that will soon celebrate 400 years of history should host this gathering and we are especially pleased that the Commemoration Commission are here with us in good numbers. The Commemoration Commission was created to use the upcoming 250th anniversary of 1776, the 400th anniversary of the founding of Boston, and many other significant historical anniversaries, so that all local communities might tell the full range of Boston's history. It is even more fitting that a place that has seen recent transformation and is home to underserved communities is where we would come to share a transformational vision for historic preservation in Boston. Knowing that a key strategic priority of the vision is uplifting underserved communities. This evening, I will share with you a vision for historic preservation in Boston. The vision acknowledges and draws upon the significant preservation work that has been achieved in Boston. It reflects upon the current preservation landscape, including the challenges that we face, and importantly, it seeks to embrace an incredible opportunity to chart a path forward, one that positions historic preservation to proactively demonstrate and encourage environmental stewardship, one that is responsive, relevant, and in alignment with contemporary values of equity, diversity, and inclusion. In this slide, you might note that our most noteworthy challenges are also great opportunities. The vision identifies issues and challenges opportunities and ideas, strategic priorities, and potential next steps that have ties to some of the work that the Commemoration Commission may ultimately advise upon. I thought I might start this presentation with the first locally designated historic district in the Commonwealth, and that's Beacon Hill. In the Book of Boston, the last chapter is titled A Suggested Tour of Federal Boston. It includes a list of historic sites concentrated 
on Beacon Hill. And long before its designation and following the siege of Boston, we can acknowledge that Beacon Hill was transformed into an enclave of wealthy and powerful Bostonians. And it continues to serve as the seat of political power in the Commonwealth. We know that the southern slope of Beacon Hill was developed with lavish homes for Boston's elite. And that the north and western slopes served as the home of working middle class communities, including many free African Americans. This area became a hotbed of abolitionist and underground railroad activity in the years leading up to the Civil War. Centered on the north slope of Beacon Hill, the African American community of the 1800s Boston led the city and the nation in the fight against slavery and injustice. This remarkable, these remarkable men and women together with their allies were leaders in the abolition movement, the Underground Railroad, the Civil War, and early struggle for equal rights and education. Today, the Beacon Hill Historic District is considered to be one of the finest and least altered examples of a large federal period urban area in the United States. It is also nationally recognized for its remarkable and often overlooked history, a potential opportunity that the Commemoration Commission might consider. In exploring the questions of events, places, people like George Middleton, an African-American who built the oldest house standing on Beacon Hill, may be revealed. And these are matters likely to be of direct interest to the Commemoration Commission. We know about the Lewis and Harriet Hayden House at 66 Phillips Street whose owners had escaped slavery in the 1850s from Kentucky before settling on the north slope of Beacon Hill and establishing the most active underground railroad safe house in the city. This photograph from around 1909 shows part of the shield for the construction of a tunnel under Beacon Hill. And as mentioned previously, 5 Hickey Street is the oldest house on Beacon Hill. And it was owned by Lewis Flappian and George Milton, who were among the first African Americans to settle in Beacon Hill's North Slope. As we seek to uplift underserved communities, might further investigation reveal that there is a story to be told about this property and an association with the LGBTQ plus history. We know about others documented as part of the historic homes on the Black Heritage Trail. These are known places associated with helping runaway slaves evade the law on both the north and south sides of the hill. But how do we know which places and which stops along the Underground Railroad Existed when this was a very secretive operation. What type of information remains unknown or unwoven into the story of Boston? Might an investment of time and resources be beneficial so that additional layers of information can be uncovered and so that a more complete story of Boston might be told? In Dorchester, the Shirley Eustace House was known among nearby residents to be associated with enslaved people. It was the oral history that kept the story alive, and subsequently confirmed by research and archaeological investigation. Imagine how many similar places might be discovered or lost due to an information gap. In Charlestown, our archaeological program is setting out to narrow the information gap 
through a community led group that would have the community ask questions about new information that may be uncovered. The vision for historic preservation in Boston recognizes challenges and opportunities. Presented when there are information gaps that impact our ability to tell the full story. The vision includes a strategic focus that prompts us to ask, how might we contribute to the national focus of uplifting underserved communities? Like how might we celebrate the contributions of the Haitian community in revitalizing Codman Square in Dorchester? Or the Vietnamese community's efforts to save Eagles Corner after the Vietnam War in 1975? How might we recognize the legacy left by the Jewish community along Blue Hill Avenue? Might it be ben beneficial to invest time and resources in understanding how the layers of Boston's history might be told in relation to the effects of displacement on immigrant communities? Marshalling investment and attention, attention to honor a history that includes all Bostonians not only that of certain communities, and that is a key aspect of the commemoration commission's remit. For example, until the end of World War II, the New York Streets neighborhood was a vibrant, multi-ethnic neighborhood of tenement houses and mom and pop shops. But it fell to make way for Boston's first urban renewal project. The city took control in 1955, and by 1957, 321 buildings had been demolished and a thousand residents displaced from their homes and community. Who were the residents that lived there? What might we learn from such events that erased Scully Square? Scully Square was a vibrant community in downtown Boston named for William Scully a prominent local developer and militia officer. It was another Boston neighborhood that was removed through urban renewal. The reasons for clearing Scully Square were based on its physical appearance and its social fabric. But by directing early urban renewal efforts to that area, the resulting loss of 1,500 structures was considered a terrible blow to the historic fabric of Boston's downtown and would permanently alter the daily human experience of the neighborhood. We know that Scully Square was an entertainment district of Boston up until it was demolished in the 1960s to create City Hall. This area was home to several LGBTQ plus bars, which were often raided by police to terrorize the community. The Commemoration Commission agreement includes marshalling investment and attention to honor a history that includes all Bostonians, and that would include exploring places that reflect the contributions of the LGBTQ plus community. Perhaps it is important that we invest time and resources to contribute to the development of a commensurate commemoration to parts of Boston that were previously erased. One might ask, what would the commensurate commemoration look like? Might it inform future development? And where practical, might it be worth exploring ways to stitch back the historic fabric of a community in a way that would be of interest to the community as well as tourists? And might it also be a source that contributes to the local economy, creating tourism and economic development opportunities that are associated with historic events, places, and people is a key aspect of the Commemoration Commission's remit. So many cities have a traumatic story to tell about their most vulnerable people being removed, and not just in recent history. In 1676, colonists removed the Massachusetts tribe to concentration camps on Deer and Long Island. 
It is anticipated that there are several areas of unmarked burials on these islands, but their exact locations are unknown. Is this an area that we might work in partnership with the Massachusetts tribe to understand uh, the resources, locate and record unmarked burials? Might there be other areas that should be investigated? These questions represent important investigative and research matters that relates to the vision's efforts to tell a more complete story and to uplift underserved communities. This will, of course, require time and resources. In relation to time and resources, I'm reminded that there are other types of opportunities that arise from a strength and a challenge that relates to a key aspect of the Commemoration Commission's remit. For most of the last half century, it has been a standard practice across the nation to devote nearly 100% of time and resources within historic preservation programs to processing applications and designating important places. We can acknowledge that such a focus has produced outcomes that reflect a particular strength and a host of challenges. In 1955, when Beacon Hill was designated a local historic district, the tools that were developed to protect the significance of the place were designed to achieve a certain outcome. And it was very effective, given the emphasis and priorities of the day. To be sure, preservationists are to be commended for their efforts in seeking to protect places of great historic importance that teach us about a certain aspect of our past. A heightened interest in a resource-intensive approach to reform architectural preservation and restoration activities was evident in the 1955 legislation that set out to protect Beacon Hill. Yeah. And it remains evident in the practice of historic that has influenced a deliberate focus as to how historic preservation has been practiced for almost 70 years. Examining our mechanisms, policies, procedures, so that we make the best use of this opportunity to revitalize and revolutionize our approach is consistent with the commemoration commission's remit. If we consider the great opportunities and challenges that contribute to the baseline conditions of the Office of Historic Preservation, you will see that it is made up of three divisions. The Archaeological Program, the Boston Landmarks Commission, and the Commemoration Commission. There are a total of 11 commissions that may utilize up to 94 volunteers who are drawn from a limited pool. The number of volunteers increases with, with each district designation as a result of the enabling legislation that governs how historic preservation is practiced. In relation to the Landmarks Commission, where a vision seeks to uplift underserved communities and mitigate adverse effects of climate change through historic preservation, the Commission has previously outlined their priorities to replace the demolition delay regulations known as Part of 85 revise the enabling legislation, and update historic resource surveys. This represents three considerable challenges, and I would say three significant opportunities. In relation to staff time, the area outlined in red indicates that at least 60% of the office's resources are allocated to the landmark and district commissions. At least 62% of this resource allocation is allocated primarily to design review. In relation to design review, 
95% of the applications that are required to go to the commission are substantially appropriate before they get there because of the great work that staff undertake with applicants before a public hearing. And in New York, 95% of the 13,000 applications received per year are resolved at the staff level. While the vision identifies strategic priorities and opportunities for a broader rethink of how we might invest time and resources, it also identifies opportunities and challenges in reflecting the diversity of the community. The data nationwide, in terms of diversity within the historic preservation profession, is even more challenging. In relation to the Commemoration Commission, where the vision seeks to uplift underserved communities, it is anticipated that the Commission will not only advise on upcoming historic anniversaries, but an opportunity exists to begin telling the full range of Boston's history with the support of three subcommittees each with specific goals for advising the mayor and relevant departments. An opportunity also exists to consider Boston's preservation policies and tools to ensure they are robust and inclusive of all history, including the history of indigenous, black, immigrant, LGBTQ+, women, and other historically marginalized communities. Which important events, people, and places might attract a tourism interest and generate an economic development stimulus? Perhaps consideration of the vast opportunities within the education and awareness scene and how those seeds might be planted in the Boston public school system. Or how historic resource surveys, which are critical important not only to preservation planners, but are essential to any informed land use decision, including how a demolition delay process might be designed to achieve best practice environmental outcomes, and how surveys are necessary for comprehensive planning and zoning reform. Perhaps the commission might reduce a challenge and advance a significant opportunity to revitalize and revolutionize our approaches, to safeguard meaningful places, local events, and the people who are too often left out of the official narrative of Boston's history. And in doing so, this would be achieved while being more reflective of the diversity of Boston. In relation to the archeological program, where the vision seeks to uplift underserved communities, in preparation for the 250th anniversary, we envision a focus on the Battle of Bunker Hill and diverse histories, including native and black participants in battle enslaved members of Charlestown and women and children. We envision a focus on community archaeology, where the community might participate in an archaeological group and subsequent analysis. And we envision an expanded opportunity for partnerships with indigenous peoples, from the identification and protection of graves to celebrating traditional practices intangible cultural values and co-leading tours for university students. Up to this point, I have identified several issues and challenges, some opportunities and ideas, and now for some strategic priorities. A key strategic priority of the vision, which includes updating and streamlining historic preservation regulations, practices, and procedures 
that in turn would support an investment of time and resources in uplifting underserved communities and mitigating the adverse effects of climate change. To do this, we would like to uh, review existing regulations with the Landmarks Commissions that could support streamlining. This might include everything from preparedness for public hearings that are reserved for impactful applications to a substantial and sustainable commissioner roster that supports efficiency and customer service. In relation to the designation process, there are approximately 76 pending landmarks and two pending landmark districts where some petitions date back to 1977. Under the current system, it could take more than a decade to clear the backlog. And that is accompanied by an assumption that there would be no new petitions during that period. Clearing the backlog and developing a more sustainable approach going forward is part of streamlining. In relation to our legislative authority, the vision recognizes that we must not exercise authority over properties where no such authority exists. But as with any certified local government in the nation, we should be exercising our authority under federal, state enabling legislation to designate historic resources deemed to be important to the city of Boston. That includes places that are of local significance. Now, I understand that there has been an interpretation in the legislation that has led to a certain practice. However, this is a fundamental authority that has been confirmed by the City of Boston Law Department in recent weeks that local designation is allowed within the existing legislation. In relation to streamlining the design review process to support efficiency and excellence in customer service, this could be this could include everything from expedite, expediting certain reviews to inserting consistency in district standards. Now, incorporating and expanding best practices will serve the Landmarks Commission, staff, and our commission better. Once a property is designated, we need to consider how we can be the most helpful to our customers. In getting them to a user-friendly process that charts a straightforward and transparent path while safeguarding the special interests of the place. This would allow for the development of a historic context statement and administering historic resource surveys that are focused on underserved communities. This would allow for rethinking Article 85 as a climate action strategy, supporting environmental stewardship through historic preservation product projects, exploring distressed homes as affordable housing options, and exploring pilot projects to support climate action mitigation measures. In turn, we believe this would provide an opportunity for broadening the historic preservation program, education and awareness opportunities, excellence in customer service, and increased interdepartmental collaboration. Among the strategic priorities would be rethinking Article 85, not as an extension of the same thing, but rather as a climate action strategy. The objective would be to draw strength from the environmentally responsible action of recycling, introduce incentives for best practice environmental stewardship, and significant disincentives to discourage actions that produce adverse effects on the environment. A strategy would be to incentivize the use of embodied energy that already exists in structures and embrace new development that would leave a smaller carbon footprint. That standard approach involving demolition and new construction without regard to environmental stewardship 
<coughs> is not part of the vision's uh, recommendations. These are potential initiatives that could be uh, considered, including uh, repairing older and historic properties in underserved communities for greater climate resiliency. We know that naturally occurring affordable housing is key to providing good quality homes for to seniors, working families, and first time homeowners. Published data shows that the largest percentage of distressed single family homes in Boston are within the communities of Dorchester, Roxbury, and Mattapan. Another strategic priority might draw a connection between climate change and historic preservation. There can be no doubt that climate change has and will continue to impact historic places. Essentially, we all need to do our part in reducing the adverse effects of climate change. In relation to climate action strategies, these three known facts play an important role in this vision. Buildings are largest consumers of energy and the most severe harms from climate change falls disproportionately on underserved communities. In this regard, it would be beneficial to invest in those underserved communities with energy audits, weatherization, and basic maintenance. These low-tech interventions are often labor-intensive and use local materials, which in turn is good for the local economy. We need to acknowledge that historic preservation is a powerful tool for housing and economic development. Boston's local economy is inextricable from its unique and historic environment. One of the common threads in this vision is the imperative related to keeping an eye on investment. How might such investments be made? We can acknowledge that certified local governments have a responsibility for maintaining up-to-date and accurate surveys of its historic resources. We know that the U.S. Department of the Interior's Historic Preservation Fund includes surveys, but as with most partnerships, we'll likely need to come to the table with matching funds. Could we partner with the National Park Service for underrepresented community grants? The vision leans toward an equitable and sustainable vision for historic preservation in Boston. And it keeps an eye on the 250th anniversary of the nation and subsequently the 400th anniversary of Boston. These are two major milestones that the Commemoration Commission will advise upon. And if you look closer into the eye, you will see strategic priorities, including opportunities for professional development for staff, capacity building, and identifying the window of opportunity that will support proactive preservation planning. In closing, we can acknowledge that the practice of historic preservation has been built and sustained on the priorities framed primarily from the perspective of white decision makers. Equity and accessibility within the practice are vital to ensure we uplift underserved communities and create means for people of non-dominant racial identities to participate and effectively lead preservation programs. In addition to the 21st century challenges of climate change, affordable housing, civil unrest, development pressures, and the need to integrate all aspects of the city, we need to do this through an equity lens. The vision would seek to explore streamlining regulations and processes and adding new preservation tools and practices so that time and resources can be invested in uplifting underserved communities. So when we think about Boston, the evidence is clear that it is unquestionably a richer place for having its African leading us. 
is Chinatown, knowing very well that Chinatowns are at risk across the nation. Boston is richer for its Beacon Hill, the High Park Women's Heritage Trail, Boston Common, its brownstones, and let's not forget the intangible cultural values, including ethnic foods, the cannoli at Mike's Pastry, and the oral tradition of storytelling. And by 2020, 2030, Boston's Office of Historic Preservation will be nationally known for its transformative efforts to uncover, share, and preserve local stories of the city's rich history, advancing environmental stewardship and uplifting underserved communities for the benefit of present and future generations. In terms of the next step, they may include taking all of the feedback that uh, we receive, community and interdepartmental engagement, action planning, and we know there's more. For example, we know that there is an interactive exercise that we would ask if you write down your thoughts about these questions, exchange them with someone near you, and we'll hear a few of them before we get into a Q&A session. And for those that we do not hear now, we will aim to collect. Thank you so much. All right, so if we can turn the lights back up. There was a lot in there. Um, maybe that's all things that you've worked on before, you've already drafted with before, maybe they're very new. What we want to take an opportunity um, to do is to really lean into the fact that the goal of this is not just to have the staff of the Historic Preservation, um, the Office of Historic Preservation leading this, but really you lead it to us. The reality is the work of this of office has always involved a lot of amazing volunteer energy and support. And the only way we achieve these goals is with you, those of you in the room, and I think there's about 50 people online, 